Yeah, this is the Bilge Podcast. If it looks a little bit different to you guys, it's because uh, we moved all the podcast equipment from the Battleborn RV. We moved it up to the upstairs house here, so Trait and I figured we'd hop on this podcast. It's the end of the Elite Series season. The RV is parked. All the equipment is taken out of the Battleborn RV, and this is kind of a test run, matter of fact, because we fully intend on traveling west and doing a couple traveling pods uh, all throughout the U.S. Open, uh, the Juan Bass U.S. Open, which is a big, big, big Western uh, tournament, and uh, we love to fish it every year, as well as Rick Klun, some other Western guys. Um, but uh, yeah, we figured we would hop on a pod here. This is uh, this is. It's kind of a trial run too, right? Because what we want to do, we don't want to have to take our RV everywhere right now. Um, it's just we can be a little more agile without it because it's so big. So if we can figure out how to pull these off in different locations, but kind of keep the quality up, milk boy style, Charles, uh, that's what we're going to do. Try At the U.S. Open, we're talking about putting this up in a, one of the casinos, maybe in uh, one of their suites or something, and having some of those OG guys from out west come through. Uh, Paul Bailey, if you're listening, that's one of the people I really want to sit down and talk with, Billy out there. But if... So this is, we did this in just a few hours. It, we didn't even know if we could pull it together. It is what it is. It's a little rough looking, but if we can get the flow down where we can just uh, load it up and hop on in the truck or on a plane and go meet people, that's what we're going to try and do. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, <laughs> I had several chores today and the main chore was to get that build podcast sign up b- behind trait right there. I ham- mm-hmm. hammered a couple of nails in my wall. Wasn't too happy about that, but anything for the Bilge podcast, anything to uh, to kind of fill in the off season. Um, you know, Trait said, "Well, you know, we'll hop on a pod. She'll kind of interview me, uh, just much like we did at the start of the season when we announced, uh, hey, you know, you know, we're parting ways with Mega Best, we're parting ways with Skeeter and Yamaha, and we're moving that on." That wasn't this season. You left them last season, correct? Or, or you left Mega Best yeah. last season? And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 we're going to kind of touch on that and kind of reflect on the season. Um, terrible season, by the way, but we're going to kind of reflect on the season over the next 30, 45 minutes or so, uh, as well as just kind of try to provide, uh, just kind of fillers, right? The, the tournament season's over, but we like to stay engaged. We really enjoy sitting down, setting up the podcast. I know Charles really enjoys it. He's got his headphones on. Charles likes holding the camera and going on the adventures with us. Um, but uh, You're throwing yourself softballs right now, and uh, we're, we got to get to business. So 60th and AOI, that's where you ended up. When you started uh, the podcast, the first podcast this year, you talked about how you had to do a bunch of media uh, in case a year like this happens and then a year like this happened, right? That, that was kind of the thing. Like, what do you do if you don't fish well? What do you have to show sponsors? And then here we are. And so first 60th in AOI, you were actually like 80th in AOI, 81st going into the last two events. Um, what uh, what do you think happened? What went wrong this year where you missed your first classic in like eight years, seven, eight years? Uh, the easy answer is an, just an excuse. I, it's, you know, I, someone asked me a couple couple weeks ago uh at matt pangrak actually on his podcast um he he was saying hey look you know you've got all these sponsor obligations you have your uh, you got a podcast uh, you're starting up the youtube thing and this and that and yeah sure like the easy thing is to make excuses and say i'm busy off the water uh i can say that but i really enjoy that stuff off the water so i'm not going to use that as as an excuse with it being my uh was it my 12th season or 13th season on tour i think it was my 12th Next season would be my 13th season. Things, you know, 12 years into it, um, and this guys who are one year, two year, and three years into this, like, can't say this or can't even fathom this. Like, 12 years into a profession, especially professional bass fishing with all the egos and all the professionalism, and you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to fit this mold and this and that. Like, things that make me, like, happy on the water, whether it's competitive fishing or throwing a big swim bait, have changed over 12 years so when i'm out there competing it's like man i don't i don't really really feel like you know picking up uh you know a jig headed minnow and using forward-facing sonar to ensure 
a 30 plus, you know, place finish. It's like, I'd rather be stubborn and hard head, literally thinking, and I'd rather go grind a crankbait or throw a swim bait or hop a big giant jig. Wait, but, but so, do you, do being hard headed. Do, do you attribute that to just your first three quarters of the season and not your last two tournaments? Like, is that how you felt? Or like, like, or are you just saying that to compensate for something else or? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, it's you shit. You fish tournaments. You know how it is. I mean, I suck, when you're though. not, do, when you're not doing good, I it's never, easy to make excuses. But I never did well, period. So, you know, <laughs> I never did well in the water. So I don't know, you know, I always had to do well on the business side to make up for it. I didn't have a choice. And, uh, cause tournament fishing definitely didn't pay my bills. So, yeah, I mean, it was a rough rough start to the season. I used the term swampy from the start. Uh, was there ever any point that you could pinpoint anything? Uh, well, at the time, and all tournament fishermen know this, at the time you feel like you're doing the right thing, right? You do. You take 12 years of experience fishing these types of tournaments and applying it to that moment, and you make the decisions right then, right then, right then, and then all of a sudden, eight hours in the tournament, and then that that ninth hour when you weighed in thirteen pounds and twenty pounds is leading it, it's like, oh man, maybe I should have made a different decision. But at the moment, you know, when you're making all these crappy decisions, you think it's the right decision. But you know, after six tournaments go by, seven tournaments go by, and you're sitting in eighty first place in, in in the standings, uh, there's a point where you're just like, man, okay, I need a little break, which was nice because we had like a three or four week break or whatever it was. We went up north, we kind of reset, and then we kind of got back on track as was far that as decision, tournament fishing goes. Was that decision, like, do, when you'd come in and someone, you'd have 13, 14 pounds and thought it was good, and then someone had 20, do you feel like that decision was, like, okay, you weren't using forward-facing sonar and should have been this year? Well, it's like, because there's a lot of conversation about how it's dominated our sport from from the first tournament. Did you feel like that, that it was dominating those tournaments, or do you feel like you were just off? Uh, well, there's a hundred dudes and, you know, I would say 20, 18 to 20 of them are super proficient at forward facing sonar. So you can throw those guys in the top 60, like every single tournament that forward facing sonar is relevant, but was that know, every tournament this year that it yeah, played? Yeah, absolutely. Did it play on the Sabine? Maybe, but everything else. It yeah. Played. That's like the only exception. But every other tournament, it definitely, I mean, like the one Palmer won when he was, you know, he was pitching cypress trees, but he saw them spawning on the cypress trees with forward facing sonar. So, I mean, that topic's been beat to death. Like, everyone's uh, yeah, been I don't want to go about, there. Everyone's been talking about forward facing sonar. I don't want to go there. I'm just, my phone is blowing up just today of like, you know, some of the older dudes saying this thing must be banned, blah, 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 blah. It is ba and Bassmaster's asking you guys, that's really what sparked this, right? It seems like the last tournament, there were people at Bassmaster who were asking anglers their feelings. And so this is an actual conversation going on behind the scenes, correct? This isn't just people whining. Yeah, no, I mean, they're actually, uh, they assigned a guy who is relevant with bass and he, he wears a bass shield he's employed by bass they assigned a guy you know that guy to call and i i can say it i'm not gonna say any names but he says hey he called me up and said hey i've been assigned to survey eight relevant anglers uh and what's your take on on the forward facing sonar band should we completely get rid of it should we just wild west it or should we limit it somehow and I kind of casted my vote, and at the time, I let some other anglers in, in kind of my circle, uh, older dudes, younger dudes in my circle know, like, hey, look, this is the topic conversation. That's when really when it caught fire. Now, I've been dove hunting <laughs> the last couple couple weeks, so I kind of disconnect. I casted my vote. I disconnected from all of that because I don't – it's just such a bickering back and forth thing. We did a couple things on the internet about it. Everyone has – uh, where they have landed, I don't know. It's been like two weeks. Where they landed, I, I have no clue. Um, but that debate is still ongoing. Um, and I probably should check in and see see where they're at on that. But We're, we're going to actually do a podcast uh, here soon. I've been kind of feeling out um, with my friends. I have fr re friends who are involved with tackle companies, you name it. And I've been asking them, you know, about tackle sales. Has it really been affected? Because that's a rumor. 
uh, not really rumor, we've had conversations, you know, Hackney on our podcast said that, you know, his style of fishing when it comes to product development isn't really a thing right now because it's all baits for, you know, forward facing sonar. But um, I've been reaching out to them and trying to gain some data, also going to reach out and try and get some data when it comes to the conservation side. I know some people who have actually been doing studies. So we just want to find the truth and get some real data on that. So let's change that subject because it has been beat to death and uh, go back to your 60th and AOI and all of that. Um, so you got through, you, you, you had two good tournaments the last of the year to end the year. So you feel good about those, you know, or do you feel like you had more to give? You did bad at St. Clair though. Yeah. St. Clair was, yeah, it was St. Clair is like an Okeechobee. If you're not in the right area, you're not going to catch it. They just don't live there. And so you were not as far in... as you can see, like there's just water everywhere. Charles, right. That's the first time Charles was there. It's a crazy lake. And it, it, there's no like single rock to go to, to catch a fish. There's no single, uh, you know, grass patch to go to. It's just a giant flat thing. And, and I caught a ton of fish. They had me on live. They selected me to go on live. I don't know why, uh, shout out to Ronnie Moore. Um, but Hopefully we're entertaining and or educating. I always say that. Um, if I'm not catching fish, hopefully I could do one or the other. Uh, but then we turned it on. The last two tournaments of the year, we had we had really good tournaments. Um, smallmouth fishing is... I love doing it, but nowadays... <laughs> again, hear this a lot. Nowadays, the guy from Louisiana, the guy from Georgia... Never smallmouth fish in his life can go up there and compete and win against a guy from California who cut his teeth on the, the deep clear water reservoirs out there. And it, damn, I sound old now. Um, or a Gussie who grew up in, you know, Canada, smallmouth fish his whole life. I mean, there are guys from Georgia and Louisiana who outfish him because of technology. So, are you. Uh... I don't even want to go there on this podcast. Yeah. Okay. So 60th and AOI, you, that means you missed the classic. Have you been having to talk to your sponsors? I know I've been talking to your sponsors, uh -huh. but have you had to have those conversations? Have they said like, dude, you know, like when you don't make a classic and you're as tenured as you are, I, you can say that now, does it affect you um, from a financial standpoint? Mm, I mean, well, that's why we, that's why we do podcasts and set up YouTube. Just like you said, um, being a professional angler nowadays especially is way 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 more than just catching fish smiling and wearing a jersey that's got fishing logos on it it's way more than driving a truck that's got fishing logos on it and a boat that's got fishing logos on it this day and age you have you got to do more and more and more at the very least you got to be active on instagram and facebook Look at Larry Nixon. Look at uh, David Fritz. I mean, those guys have Instagrams and Facebooks, and they're fairly active on it. That's at the very least. And those guys have AOY titles and classic titles. Um, so just think about like the one-year guys and two-year guys and three-year guys who are coming up in this sport who are starting from scratch and who think that they could get it done with a rod and rail fishing, fishing this, fishing that. I will strap your logo on my chest. Dude, it doesn't work like that. It is so, so, so hard to make it. We had one guest on our pod the other day, a big name dude, probably the one of the biggest names uh, in our sport. And when the cameras went down, boy, did he really, really, really give it to us. Real, like really real. And some of my friends who watch this podcast or some of my friends who know who I'm talking about and who I've texted and said, Hey, look, like he really laid it out there. I really wish we could rewind it and kind of ask the questions that kind of provoked that response in him. Um, and, uh, it's, I don't, th I don't know that he would let us go there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. here's, it's so hard. And when the people at the top of the sport are saying it's potentially a dead end, if you want to be a tournament fisherman, and make a decent living that Something's that's wrong with that. that's a that's like even my heart kind of you know i'm a very pess not pe i don't want to say pessimistic but i am i just see a lot of the flaws and i wish i didn't and so then when someone says that 
and it stops even me like thinking how bad is the situation that you know and um so you have to do a lot more than just turn there's no more just going tournament fishing and becoming a brand and making a lot of money um it's just not how it works anymore unfortunately i just you know the sport of bass fishing is 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 again it's driven by passion it's driven by a whole lot of egos and there's always someone behind you willing to do just a little bit more yeah. and that it that those are just words and for like a lot of the young anglers who watch this podcast and i get a lot of guys who who tournament fish uh, who come up to me and say, man, that was an awesome podcast with so-and-so and this and that. Like, Dude, I'm just up here and I'm trying to talk to English. And we're, we're all trying to learn this thing together because it yeah. constantly changes. Uh, but again, in, in this day and age, <laughs> someone is always willing to grab this this phone right here and just say, oh, I'm doing so-and-so and this today and this and this and that today. Or someone's got the dough to hire someone like Charles to hold a camera so, and to follow him so around. So what's your response? Because, man, what you weren't on Bass Live at all this year. <laughs> no. That's so crazy. No. Uh, but usually when you are, because you are Chatty Cathy and you like to put yourself out there, what's your response to those people who type, I wish he would just shut up and fish? <laughs> because you get those. On yeah. every time you're Hell on yeah. Bass Live, you get a, you know guys yep. commenting either in the forums or on the posts from the live feed. So uh, here it is, guys, who comment that. It is better to Charles back me up on this. He's an editor. He's the best shooter. Um, it is better to have that stuff in the can. That's old school term in the can and not use it than not have it and need a filler or need a how to for this segment for Tommy Sanders or for Mark Zona to segue, or maybe they just had an image of an underwater smallmouth on a rock. So when I'm saying I'm casting over here because there's an underwater boulder with these smallmouth that hang out there. It just goes with it. They could cut it out. They could edit it all later. We got all this camera equipment here, all these cords. Looks like spaghetti here. It's better just to throw it out. I always shoot from the hip first and ask questions later. That's a great way to live in this industry. Just throw it out there. They could always edit it and cut it later. It's terrible to be married to someone who does (laughs) that because, golly. Y'all know, so... Um, I follow that um, guy, um, Slick, uh, on TikTok. I watch his stuff, and he posted that video when you were dropping that bait fish oh, yeah. in that mouth. And wife. I just thought... I didn't think I was doing anything which wrong. He, he was like, I didn't. he didn't find an issue with it. We ended up talking to him, but um, I know you didn't find an issue with it. I obviously did. I just thought he he's going to be DQ'd and not make the classic and what has he done. But he is very much that guy who lives to entertain and then thinks about, Oh wait, maybe I shouldn't have done that after the fact. And that as his wife, uh, Hmm. especially when you have a podcast like this, asking people to be transparent and stuff like that. When those moments happen, you have to face them head on. And it's, uh, Ooh, you know, you do some things, babe, that I'm, but it it you're gonna when you're you trying to entertain you're gonna probably cross the line every now and then, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a that was back at Champlain a couple couple years back. Caught a fish. It spit spit up an ale. I was dude, and and by the way, so this year I gotta say this. So this year at Champlain, um, everyone was live scoping, forward facing sonar in these balls of smallmouth that are crushing bait fish either on the surface or underneath the surface balls of bait. Charles saw, saw it and they're using, you know, using forward facing sonars and they're throwing drop shots and things at them. That's the exact same bite I got on two years ago, but I was using my eyeballs when they would surface. I would jam over there, throw a spoon over there let it flutter and catch one fish. Just one little did I know that this, you know, forward facing sonar hasn't caught on to, you know, two years back Little did I know, there were probably dozens and dozens and dozens of fish underneath that that one I caught. Um, but, uh, you know, going back to that term, you said that dude slick, you know, he threw it out there and everyone commented, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, caught a small mouth. It jumped. It spit. Or I, I boat flipped it. It jumped. I think I caught it on a spoon or top water and it spit out the little alewife in the boat and I hold it up. I'm like, oh, look at that. He, he spit up an alewife. That's awesome. I think they came from the Atlantic Ocean. I, someone fact check that and i was like there you go buddy and i like threw it back in his gullet and i put it back on the live well not think it's not like oh 
oh, dude, I need that quarter of an ounce. I wasn't thinking that. I was just like, oh, I was just trying to be fun. Whatever. Entertaining, funny, whatever. Stupid. I don't know. Stupid. Put it in the live well. Had you go ever, to weigh in. That L live is floating in the in the in the live well. And then Chris Bose and Lisa like came to me, like just like ambushed me and said, Hey, look, we have an issue here. I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong, did I? And they brought that up and people wanted to DQ me and this and that. And I was just like, oh, it's a and they, unintentional, but they a, never found a rule. A that, thousand percent. They were going to DQ him yeah. if they could find a rule I to think. DQ him with. And they could not. They looked yeah. because you would think that that was illegal. His wife, me, I thought it was illegal. I thought he deserved to be DQ'd. I, I thousand percent. I ripped him a new one and said, you know, you're going to be DQ'd. There goes your classic. And I told and they, them. They, it could, was... they couldn't find a rule. They had to make a rule, which is sad. I hate to know that my husband's a reason why they made that. a rule. Yeah, they made a rule that year. So now you can't do that because the rule before was artificial or, you know, you can put something artificial in the fish or dead. Maybe I, or, no, it was artificial because that fish was dead. Whatever it was. It the, was bad optics for sure. Like when I looked at it, it, was, it was definitely bad. Had optics. you ever, please clear the air. You never did that before. No, ever. no, not at all. Ever. It was purely just to entertain. Entertainment. The camera was going. It was just like, oh, let's try to be funny. It wasn't so funny. I mean, it, think about it. Okay. So what if that small mouth bit a fluke off of someone's hook? And still had it in its mouth, and then like I hook it, and then it jumps, it spits the fluke on the floor, and I grab the fluke and stick it back in there. Like that's, that's bad. illegal. It's like the same thing, yeah. kind of the same thing, but it, not really. Yeah. Anyways, we made the classic that year. We did not this year. Okay, so yeah, you didn't make the classic. So they came out with. So normally you struggle in the southeast, and this year they came out with the sec- schedule. <laughs> And you don't start in the southeast. You start in the state of Texas. You don't go to the southeast until April. Do you think that that, do you like that? Are you excited for that? What are your feelings about the schedule? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, I don't know exactly what the schedule is, but when I looked at it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's going to be a swim bait one, a swim bait one. That's going to be a spoon one, spoon one. Oh, really? No, not really any sight fishing tournaments. Awesome. So um, there's no sight fishing? Uh, I think Even there in Texas? might be. I they get? think there might be. Um, what's the third tournament? The classic, and you're not fishing in yeah. it on grand. Yeah, I mean, I, I we didn't make the classic, uh, obviously, but um, whatever the next tournament is after that might be a sight fishing tournament. I don't know. Um, but no, I think that's awesome that they are listening to the anglers because just about every angler agreed we need to go to Florida outside of February and January. Like they take us there on January 31st through February 15th, and fishing sucks it really does it sucks so, so um with all that forward facing sonar because i actually did prep this for this podcast because i'm just over some things um that forward facing sonar uh situation you know how uh, mullins had made that post about you know everyone's talking about forward facing sonar and no one's talking about payouts and stuff and all of that and then um the schedule came out and and my whole beef with the the payouts not going up is because there's no money to bring them up, right? We're probably tapped out viewership wise and demographics wise, unfortunately. And um, so my feeling behind it is why don't we expand to a bigger market? So I was doing the, the everyone was on the forums was pissed off about the uh, schedule and Bass goes to the same old, same old place. And I don't necessarily have a problem with same old, same old, but uh, when I did the math, I, I did the math since the split of everywhere we've, we've been. Put it all on an Excel. And then I went on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife website and um, I assigned per their how they do it by region uh, where those bodies of water fell. And um, out of 54 tournaments, not including any of the classics, just y'all's elites, since the split, 55.6% of the time... The tournament has been in the southeast region. And and then 20.4% of the time in the northeast. Core S- audience. So 70. Core audience. You think that's the core audience? Of course, the southeast. How, absolutely. Okay, well, if your core audience lives there and you're trying to attract new viewers, why the hell would you not go to new places, other regions? Especially, when's the last time y'all went to Missouri 
or yeah. Oklahoma outside yeah. of finally no, going I to agree. Tulsa. That's the Midwest even. Not even, not the West, but like the Midwest. So the even. Midwest, 5% of the time, mm. and that's uh, only three tournaments. There's some good fishing up there too. That whole White River chain, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, so um, Missouri Falls in the Midwest, right? Yeah. Um, Mountain Prairie region, which is like your Hawaii. Nebraska, South Dakota. Yeah, y'all went to Oahe, so one tournament there. And then your your West Coast, your Pacific regions. There's two Pacific. There's a Pacific Southwest and a Pacific. Yep, y'all haven't been there at all. So uh, you've been nine times, 16.7% uh, in the Southwest region, which is Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, which all nine of those were Texas. Or one, one was Oklahoma, 10, 10 killer. So I'm really perturbed because this payout conversation is real. And so I get mad at the anglers in saying and and wanting to talk about it just because there's no more money, right? Like, (laughs) I don't think they're hoarding money. But then I get mad at Bassmaster for not making more money because I'm like, and and I apologize if any of you are my friends, but go do your job. And, And my feeling on doing your job is why do we live in the southeast they all fish yeah they all they all buy the baits yeah. they don't need you to show them how to fish sure their their grandfather's showing them how to fish that sounds like an email you need to write to chase uh i probably to, already have yeah i probably already so you know and, and you can talk about that because there's something else i want to bring up so you you give your two cents further you know well when the split happened for us of course i stayed on the bass side there were six of us that did and we would always have like these rallies, right? We always like talking about the split on this show. Um, you know, we'd always have these little rally weeks or these little meetings and these get togethers and oh, let's spitball this idea and that idea and that idea. And it seemed like after every one of those meetings, we all kind of realized not only the bass staff, but the anglers, uh, sponsors, um, we all kind of realized like, th- like it has to be a team unit, like moving towards one goal. And oddly enough, that's exactly what mlf was saying uh this is a you know this is a rocket ship we all need to pull this or all pull the rope in the one direction because this is a rocket ship and it's going up and it, it, it really is that way the anglers need to do a good job at selling at selling fun fishing fishing is fun fishing is great for your family for your kids for yourself and by the way buy fishing tackle um that's the fisherman's job Bassmaster. it their job it's it's it's, sell, it's that but also teaching your job is that's to what, teach that's what i'm saying yeah, yeah it's fun it's it's it can be educate our job is to educate it, it it's fun it's again our our job is is to show that um but then on the bassmaster side once that is done once that angler does his job whether it's chris zaldane or it's it's uh you know uh, brandon polinick or or Gerald Swindle or David Mullins. Once you do your job of, you know, promoting fishing, selling a little bit of tackle, and then, you know, BASS, not only do they provide that that national platform on FS1, but it's also their job to sell the anglers, that whole package, to the overall audience. Maybe someone in California or maybe someone in Missouri that isn't really into fishing. But that I will say that FS1 step that they took yeah, great you know. platform but 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 why don't the opens have live yet there's so much yes it's a good step but come on you know like we gotta we get content and i felt like we've gotten a little content maybe they have it maybe think doors just haven't opened but i'm i'm concerned about it uh when we talk about you know the non-endemics make or the endemics make this world go around for anglers. You know, my big, I have a huge issue with how much money that Bassmaster makes from endemics. I feel like the endemics should be spending on anglers and the big non-endemic deals should be Bassmaster going after them because they have the biggest platform ever. They have access to all the anglers. Let the anglers make what they can from the tackle companies and from the electronics companies. Stop hogging that budget. I'll say it. And you guys go chase them non-endemics. You got the big TV deal. The English don't have that TV deal. They can't go sell it. Only you can. And, and if we're living in the Southeast, these big corporations, these big non-endemics. <laughs> There's a few of them down there, but. <laughs> but it, it, and, and it's not even that. They're all about, about reaching new people and having huge demographics. Well, if, 
we don't have those huge demographics, we're, you know, I just feel like we're not, we're staying in the same lane we've always been, but expecting something different and then wondering why we still only make $100,000 at the top of the thing. You know, one of my favorite things that Greg Hagney said, he said it when the cameras went down and he said, he said, can you believe that we, we only make a hundred grand when we win? And if you make a hundred grand and win, you cannot go buy a fully rigged tournament bass boat to compete in. On that the we won that hundred grand with. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that's just crazy. He said, he says, if you win one of our tournaments, yeah. you cannot get after taxes, you cannot go and buy the same boat that you won that, that first place prize yeah. out of. That's, I, you that's, can't, that's, you win a hundred thousand and pathetic. you can't buy an $80,000, $90,000 boat. So that, yeah, that is a, uh, that that's a little lopsided. And, I mean, and, pa- and for the workers who think, okay, you're being a little harsh. We're trying, we're working our ass off. You may be doing that, but think about what all these anglers who you're selling a dream to. Yeah. Right? If this is as good as it gets, then maybe we need to scale down so the people who are involved have a little better living. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to get some of the guys who are a little more jaded. Is that the word? Uh, I can't believe I'm this jaded. You know, I feel like you make a very decent living. I I know what yeah. I bring in is yeah. pretty decent in this industry. Yeah. But I'm pissed off for the other people. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. It, it's I'd love to bring in, and this is going to be a good year of podcasting. It yeah. really is. I, I mean, I'm really pissed off over the West Coast situation yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. The best fishing in the country, probably, especially with all the water coming in, it's probably going to turn. So Texas is going through the drought now, and it's probably going to turn on out west. Like, honestly, in a couple, three years, y'all are like, it's probably going to be nuts. But how are we supposed to be the leaders, the biggest league in fishing? And we completely ignore the West Coast. Since the split, we have not been there once. Before the split, we hadn't been there in a few years. Since there's two, gotta what, be 2015? Perf- there's got to be some type of explanation. I mean, what what is their explanation? Of, what, what if the NBA had no is teams? Cost? Is it cost? What if the NBA had no West Coast teams? What if the NHL had no West Coast teams? What if NASCAR never went out West? Okay. There's always going to be a cost. But if we're leaders, we can't say, Our league isn't doing that well if we can't go out West. Well, if if cost keeps us from going out west, then we got some real problems. Well, if the NHL or NBA or any of those didn't go out west, and their, their core audience would still follow them, and I feel like that's what bass. That, that, but, I feel like that's but, what they're. But you're assuming that that core audience still exists. That core audience is dying off and aging. May, perhaps. I so don't as know. they age, you're not bringing any new pe- eyeballs out west because there's nothing for them to watch. There's no tournaments for them to go to. There's no carrot being dangled out there. This is what I was going to bring up. So the a uh, couple months ago, I was in a July 29th, apparently. That's when this is dated. I was uh, in a pretty heated little email thread. And can we just call you Randy Blockett? Yes, you can. But, here, but the difference between me and Randy Blockett is I'm fighting for the anglers to have something better. I'm fighting for transparency. And I feel like he's fighting for, I don't even know what he's fighting for, but I don't one day we need to have him on the podcast i'd love to go back and forth with him um so san jose that's where my husband's from that's where he was living when he qualified for the Bassmaster elite series so let's say this year was chris saldane's first year he lived in san jose and he had two fish all nine opens to qualify for the Bassmaster elite series and look i am t- pro having nine opens as a qualifying route because they're gonna have one of the most lethal uh rookie classes ever and that's the way it should be but to do that from the west coast uh the this is the one-way trip for you to you fall 35 hours manny louisiana 28 hours clarksville virginia 40 hours decatur alabama 32 hours one way you follow oklahoma 26 hours waddington new york 42 hours kingston tennessee 34 hours. Osage, Osage, Missouri, 28 hours. Leesburg, Florida, 40 hours. One way. Okay. For a guy from San Jose. Or from Idaho. Yeah. For, for, yeah. Okay. So what's the point? The costs, the barriers. Ain't nobody from the West Coast should even dream of being on the elites at this point. You don't go visit them. You don't have tournaments for them to watch, to light the fire. They got no way. There's their nine ways to make the classic poof gone. 
There's their nine ways to make the elites poof gone. But we want to bring in non-endemics, and the non-endemics care about the West Coast. And I just, I, I don't understand what's going on. And a lot of people don't want to talk about it behind the scenes. So I'm talking about it. Am I making this awkward for you? I'm on one. You are on one. This is why we have to have guests, because it's a buffer, Charles. It's a buffer, so I don't look crazy. You I look get it. very crazy I'm on crazy. the screen up there. I'm very crazy. Um, yeah, I'm very crazy right now. I'm just, you know, we're going out west. I've been behind the scenes trying to get something done for them. I'm very just, I just feel like if they do anything, it's a Band-Aid, and they don't really want to, you know. So let me, let me tell, okay, so you just rattled off 28 hours, 40 hours, 35 hours. Yeah, the shortest so it's the drive is like 28 hours, one way. It's the same 28, 35, 42 hours that the whole bass crew has to travel every tournament they go out there so then hire people out there you know <laughs> yeah. have people out there local or or welcome to you know there's some of them that travel out there because they do some regional events they get terrible participation and look here's the thing why do they get terrible participation right well maybe because the dream's dying out there maybe they don't even know what the dream is so uh, so so my point is if you lived out in san jose yep and you this is 10 years 12 years after you qualified. So you got to move like, so you never saw the 2000s and the ESPN explosion. You were, cause you were just three years old at that point or what, however old you would have been. Cause we're moving everything forward. So, right. So you're someone who was born during the ESPN explosion. So you never got to experience okay. that. Right. So you're fishing, but where would you be in fishing? But if you didn't experience the ESPN explosion and this is what you were facing. Well, we know we know several 21, 22, 24 year olds out there who, yeah, I mean, who are doing really well out West, but don't know what the next step is. They're confused. Yeah. I, yeah. No, no, I feel for them. And, you know, there's talks of, you know, <laughs> corrupt tours out there. Uh, what is the next step for those those Western Corrupt guys? tours, and then the very people who are a part of those tours starting new tours yeah. and acting like they weren't yeah. a part of them. I, I'm so confused. It literally is the wild, wild west. Like There's a tournament circuit called the Wild West, I think, out there. But I think it that's really what is went to the wild, wild west. That's what happens when there's no structure or there's no carrot. There's no thing to go after. You're really just throwing darts at the board and hope, hopefully something hits a bullseye. Um it, it's it, it really is it, it's um i would love to get some of like the old like an ish Monroe, like some of the or jared lintner uh who, by the have, way i'd love to have jared on i yeah. don't i don't know if ish would be completely open about everything i love ish but he he's very like he th he turns on that you know sponsor he's very good at representing a sponsor he's made a career on it i think jared would be very open about the situation he fishes out there still and ish is back out there fishing and by the way, back in 2005, Jared Lintner and I were paired together in a BASS Open, the very last BASS Open that was ever, or that the very last one they had out west, Clear Lake, California Delta, but this was on Clear Lake in 2005. We were paired together, uh, and we both won the Open, him on the pro side, me on the amateur side. That's how you and won the boat? And that's the Triton Bass Boat I won in 2005. I got it in 06, and from there on, I used that boat for the next four or five years. You never owned to, a boat before that? No. no. Was, I mean, I, I won that boat as an amateur and used that boat. So thanks to Jared Lintner for putting us around fish. We both won the tournament. I won the am side. He won the pro side. And, uh, and yeah, that was awesome. So, really, yeah, I'd love to have Jared on to talk about I, I love Jared. the state of the West Coast. And there's a lot of guys who he listen doesn't to live this there. podcast. He doesn't live there anymore. He lives in Georgia. Yeah. There's a lot of guys that listen to this podcast who, you know, are from Louisiana, are from Georgia, are from Alabama. Who, when we talk about West Coast fishing, just like ah, whatever, like we don't. How do we relate to that? Well, w yeah. You think about Brandon Polinick, you, this the Skeet Reese's, the the Brett Ayler, uh, Brent Ayler's, uh, the Brett Heights, uh, all the Aaron Martins, like all those guys, literally. You know they are gems. All of them are gems. They learn how to fish out there and then put their asses on the line to travel and make that Eastern yeah. Circuit um, 
And now I just, when was the last time we had a Western guy? Uh, Brian, uh, Brian Smith. Smith. He's Brian killing Smith. it this hey, year. Hey, 29 pounds of smallmouth yeah. the, the other day. You guys definitely, if y'all qualify, have it in you. Because yeah. you've had to go through Yeah, you earn it. You definitely earn it. to do it. Yeah, I, it, it, so that's our goal. Charles, write this down. Uh, I want to have every single Western tour guy on the Bilge podcast over the next 12 months. Um, and hopefully we could bang a couple of these out, um, again. So we got the, the mobile, mobile podcast. So it's a mobile podcast in the Battleborn RV, but this here is the mobile set where we could take this monopod and that monopod and that sign right there. And these two microphones on the road with us. And we could go talk to Cody Meyer. We could talk to Bobby Barrick from the West. We could talk to Brent Ayler, uh, from SoCal, um, and all of those guys at the Juan Bass U S open. I'd love to touch back with with rick clun by the way too he'll be there yeah. i'd love to touch back in with him and just find out where he's at uh mentally after right. after another tough season um but yeah i mean that's 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 write that down charles so the western guys are the next, he's actually writing it down i'm just joking no he's Over the not next writing 12 it down months. he's like i'm writing down what i had to take out of the and matter of fact <laughs> so i i hope you guys kind of enjoyed this kind of bickering back and forth with, with my wife and i just talking about various subjects in our head right now again it's just kind of a test run of all the equipment here and i was going to come up here upstairs get comfortable and then throw charlie under the bus and say charlie sit right here we're going to interview you charlie's the absolute man we've worked with johnny over the last few months the last few years he's awesome charles is a hard-working dude he holds the camera for our vlogs he controls the lights that fan that light up sign so right there. Charles he wasn't, crushes it. He's from East Texas, but he wasn't raised in a bass boat or anything. So we're going to uh, spend our West Coast swing teaching him all things of driving a bass boat. And yeah. uh, he's he's down to learn the life. And uh, he's a gun dude like Chris. Yeah. Uh, so they 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 vibe there, but uh, we're going to show him the bass boat ways. Yeah. So, okay. So wrapping up here, uh, since we brought Charles into the conversation, um, and again, we kind of test, test ran this equipment here, uh, and stay tuned. We will have plenty more in the pipe. A lot of the Western anglers. We want to talk to a lot of the MLF guys, man. That's always a good, we've got a few that have reached a out good that contrast. want to, yeah. I'm sure we'll have Cliff on, you know, yes. Cliff is, um, like family, you know, we, before the split and we we'll have him on uh there's someone out west i definitely want to have on i haven't texted yet but i i have a feeling he'll he'll meet us somewhere um and we've got several other guys who have reached out that that want to to talk so um um we just want to create an environment where we can all be transparent because that will help not have another split Oh, she's going to get emotional again. Well, <laughs> she's dude. so emotional these days. <laughs> I'm not. No, she's really passionate about the sport of bass fishing. I couldn't do it without Trey. I've spent the last like, couple so, of days in so many emails and phone calls over she's these She's a numbers subjects. gal. She's a numbers girl. And without her, I, I, this team wouldn't be together. Uh, you know, a couple months ago, her and I did a podcast together, and we were a little bit scared about these new steps we're taking with Bass Pro, with Mercury, with Nitro. Um, but it all turned out freaking I, awesome. I will say the people we work for over there are awesome, legit. Their communication is awesome. Their communication with her is awesome, who she communicates to me. Um, but yeah, it's a really good team effort. And thank you guys so much for, for watching and tuning into the bilge. Every time uh, we, we throw a vlog out there, you guys are commenting about the bilge. Every time we drop a bilge, you guys are commenting about the vlog. So thank you guys so much for, um, for hanging out one with thing us. though I, I do want to ask you guys so just comment it um what do you what would you guys like to see while we're out west are there specific people like if you're not from the west coast are there specific people that you you would love to hear from that you do try to keep up with but maybe they're just not at the forefront anymore are there things out west that intrigue you are there like bodies of water because we're gonna go hit some several bodies of water try and do you want to see charles on the Las Vegas Strip, huh? <laughs> After 10, 12 drinks, to comment down below on how many, how many adult sodas no. we're gonna give Charles and send down the strips. So it could be as silly as that, but comment down below. It really helps us out. Helps the 
algorithm. What a word, huh? Algorithm. Everyone okay, says see, algo. It's the algo. Up. It gets he, stuck in the algo. I'm not even asking them to comment for the algorithm. Oh. I'm asking them to comment oh, but genuine. so we can actually like put some stuff out there that yeah. add value. And you're over here like a used car salesman. Yeah. Help my algorithm. <laughs> the algo, man. Yeah. That's like the word now, the buzzword nowadays, right, Charles? Yeah. Yeah. He's rolling his eyes. All right. Uh, so wait, Charles wait, wrapping us- up. No, wrapping up. Um, so one thing you don't see on this set right now are Battleborn batteries. And um, we actually have some batteries that were supposed to be here so that we could do this. They didn't show up yet. They'll be here probably tomorrow. Um, but we wouldn't be able to do this without them. And one cool thing we're going to get to do while we're out west is meet with Dennis. And he is who started Battleborn. He a uh, Stanford professor who came up with the technology in his uh, garage and he knows more stuff about batteries and lithium than than probably, you know, most people in this world. And so with all the talk about lithium technology and what batteries you should run in a bass boat, how expensive they are, like so many little mom and pop companies popping up. Um, I can't wait to sit down with him and him explain the differences, what you need to look for, what makes one battery better than the other. Um I think that'll be a great thing. They're based in Reno, Nevada, so right yeah, after. So yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, Battleborn. The, yeah. All the equipment here in tonight's set is actually plugged into the wall, and the city provides this electricity. Yeah. Normally, this equipment is plugged in straight into 100 amp hour Battleborn batteries in series. You know, several of them. Uh, so Charles, you're gonna take us out, buddy. Uh, he's behind the cameras here. He does not have a microphone, but dad advice, give it to us straight no, up, straight up. He's going like this. I'm going to mimic everything you're doing. He's going, Oh, don't ask me. I can tell you not what or what not. Tell to us, do. tell us what not to do and we'll cut it there. Keep your kids off TikTok, please. There you go. He's, Keep your kids off TikTok. Yeah. YouTube's okay. Instagram, Facebook's okay for the most part, but all the dancing and stuff like that. But yeah, don't, can't be having that. So Charles said it here first. Thank you guys for hanging out. Keep your kids off TikTok. Thank you guys so much. And uh, until next time.